Yes. <clears throat> I'm Robert Cavuto, and today on Metal Rules, we're speaking with David Elfson and Jeff Scott Soto for the release of their collaborative debut album, Vacation in the Underworld. Welcome, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. I appreciate it. No, thanks Our for having us. Can so, you see the bags in my eyes? This is it's early. For me. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny thing is, Robert, we were saying this we were all coming on. Jeff and I haven't seen each other since Rome about a month ago. What we finished our tour. So Jeff, it's good to see you again, my friend. Hey, good to see you, David. <laughs> we should do this more often. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, we talk all the time. Friends. We send stuff back and forth through the mail because we're always signing album plots and stuff for good. But it's just funny how our worlds just circulate around. So we well, see each other nine. Nine time zones away, never, you know, in, in our own native time zones. Well, it's good that you're still friends, even after uh, a tour, right? Getting together. Oh, well, we can't stand each other now. <laughs> yeah. that, that's why we only did three shows. Let's see if we actually like each other enough while we're on the road. We liked each other enough on the internet while we made the album, but, you know, being in a, in a, in a band together, that's a whole other deal, you know. <laughs> the tour bus as well, that's a whole other story. Yeah, too. that's where bands actually break up. <laughs> yeah. <on the> road. <laughs> Well, listen, tell me, I love the album and congratulations. I think it's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me about that pivotal moment when you both realized that you had a unique chemistry and this album was going to be something special. I think for me, it was it was around song number three or four, because we, we didn't really go into this thing with the intent of making an album or starting a new band or project. It was uh, it was mainly that David was working with so many people, you know, songwriting. He's, he's got a lot of collaborations going on in his life. And... And so do I. We both have that kind of thing. That was one of the common bonds that we had. And it, it just happened. You know, he hired me for a couple tracks. And I got to the point where I was like, dude, you don't have to pay me for this. This is actually a lot of fun. And and I love what we're churning out here. So let's just keep going. And you never know what we'll do with it. Maybe we'll we'll give it to another band or we'll, we'll sell it to whatever. We'll, we'll use it for other placements. And, and it was about three or four songs deep that we realized, I think we're on to something here. And we just kept going. And before we knew, we, uh, David, what would you say? How, we had like 13 or 14 songs wow. in no yeah. time flat. And, and again, it was a pandemic. It brought a lot of bands and, and a lot of collaborations together. But for the most part, we we realized, I think this is too good to be passing on to somebody else. I think this is something we should actually consider doing in the future. And that's what it turned into. Well, that's great. How about you, David? When did you realize? Same thing. <laughs> it was uh, it was about three, four songs in, and um, um, and it just. And I remember Jeff because every time he would send him a track, he'd send something back, and me and Andy were like, you know, Wayne and Garth, like, awesome man, you know, we're <laughs> and uh, and Jeff was like, like, really, you guys don't have any notes or critiques? Like, fuck no, dude, you're Jeff Scott Soto, like, you're singing awesome, man. This is. <laughs> And, you know, to me, that's that's what it is. It's like you bring in the best people and let them be themselves, let them be the best at what they do, you know. And and I think, you know, it was it was around song three or four that it was like, OK, now <clears throat> we're kind of out of melodies and lyrics and like, Jeff, let's let's write together, you know. And and then then it really opened up the whole thing of like, OK, let's make this our our thing. And, um, you know, that's why we've got a little you know, like out of the, out of the blue, like this piano ballad and like really going there and, and just widening the scope because there's enough funny. I've got the album right here. I, I need it because I have to remember the, the, the track listing, but you know, we had enough, you know, rockers and metal things on here. And then, you know, when we started going, you know, deeper into some, some other things, we thought, you know, cause it has a, as a body of work. Yeah. What did we get? 15, 16 songs, I think total, you know um, in fact, when I was mixing with Chris Collier, oh. Even even he became a fan of. He's like, man, this is every song you mix is like. I think that might be my favorite song. Then you do another, go, God, I think that was my favorite. And and then it became this time. Go, okay, now we got to figure out what's going on the vinyl, what's going on the CD. Of course, digitally you can throw all of it up on online. But kind of coming up with this this track listing, and and certainly vacation in the underworlds. I think just was the natural fit. It, it was such a great sound. I think it was really you know if you think of. What is David Olson and Jeff Scott Soto going to sound like? I think that yeah. just that's it, man. That's that's the sweet spot. So that, that be, yeah. yeah, and it's a cool title, um, and it just I think for the graphics and the, the video and everything, it it sort of you know sort of told the you know that that's kind of the, the narrative of it all. So you know it it just came together so so seamlessly organically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. You know, David, and, and I just, sorry to cut you off. I just no, wanted to add just the fact that it, just tapping on the, what David just said in terms of, you know, J Jeff would send a, a track completed and, and we were like, thumbs up, you know, party on Garth, party on Wayne. <laughs> that made it more exciting for me because I've been part of so many recordings and collaborations in the past where it's been a, a tedious process. Okay. You write something. Okay. I think it's close. Um, we can tweak and we can do this. There was none of that. It was kind of like they were trusting me and respecting what I do and who I am as much as I was doing the same with them. Never met Andy until we actually did our first show, our first rehearsal together in, in Italy. But I trusted David, having known him for so many years, I res respected and trusted his judgment on the people he was working with. That it just, it, it kind of happened so organically and, and respectfully. And that's that's a key word there. That it didn't It didn't feel like work. It didn't feel like effort. It just felt like a natural process of creating mm. and and everybody was so stoked in the creation. We could we were looking forward to the next one and the next one. And and again, as he said, every next one that was being mixed with Chris or or even playing to others or when we were even playing it for labels, this song is better. That's my favorite. No, now that this one's my favorite. And even trying to select the singles, it, it's <laughs> a great problem to have. It, it really is. And it's, I love when those those kinds of things fall together because there's so many, and David can attest to it, so many other ways that it's been done. And and you get so used to that that kind of cluttered world of, oh, I can't, I don't want to go through this process again. And and we didn't have to with it. No, it's a very diverse album. I love it. And that's what I liked about it. It, was, it. it took me on a journey. It had some nice flow to it also. So it gave me a minute to rest from the heavy tracks and get to enjoy the slower tracks. So I like the work. Yeah. Probably. You know, David, when you and I spoke for your book um, a couple of years back, I guess, My, My Life with Death, you said that saying yes to um, opportunities and jobs really improved your life. Was this a moment where it was a yes moment for you? Totally. Well, our friend Al Petrelli taught me that <laughs> in 2002. <laughs> Megadeth had disbanded and uh, he was just previously in the group and had gone back to working with uh, Paul O'Neill and Trans-Siberian Orchestra full time again. And uh you know, in his thick Bensonhurst accent, he calls me up and goes, so uh, listen, uh, this is how this works now. Uh, you just say yes to everything, you know, and uh, <laughs> better better, better to be double booked than underbooked. And, you know, once in a while you get your ass in a sling, but you can get yourself out of it. That's, you know, and so he kind of gave me the whole rap. Oh, my because, God. You know, he'd been a side man with, uh, you know, Alice Cooper and all these big gigs. And, and you know, Al came in to save the day for Megadeth when Marty Friedman had uh, quit the group. And. So I trusted Al's instincts, you know, and still do to this day. And of course, you know, he's our mutual friend, you know, Jeff, Jeff sings in trans Spirit Orchestra. And so, um, but yeah, that, that really became um, my MO. And, and I, and I, the, the acid test was, was quick because uh, when you say yes, the phone just keeps ringing, you know, because people know you're available. They know you're out there and you're ready, willing and able to go to work and do things. As soon as you say no, even once or twice, man, it's like the phone just quits ringing. I mean, it goes dark quick. Amen. And, and, I, uh, right? I agree. Right? And, and, and I had the luxury of being in one band for, you know, since I was 18 years old, you know, with Megadeth for almost 20 years. So I never had to say yes or no to anything. I just was in one group and that's all I did. But I got to say that that moment in my life, it was it was really necessary for me, I think, to just grow as a as a young man, as a as a creative being to just start to say yes and be in be in uncomfortable situations of walking in the studio going, oh, God, I hope they like what I play. I mean, you know, and, and and not knowing, you know, Max Cavalera being an example him, Adam Sinner going, I don't know, Max, is, is this cool? I mean, he goes, he goes, fuck, dude, you're David Ellison. You play whatever you want, you know? And, and he's just like, it's fucking great. And I'm like, all right, I mean, should I, you know, and, and, and just being unsure of myself. I mean, to be honest with you, I, I didn't have much confidence in myself after all the successes I'd had in one group to now when you're out on your own, you know, being the guy hired in, <laughs> Jeff probably knows this too. It's like, I don't know. Is is this what you're looking for? Is this what you want? Um, and so you've got to go through. It's it's a, it's a bit. It wasn't for me. It was certainly an emotional thing. And I, I tend to be a guy who starts things. I mean, I've done um, very little going out and playing with people. And and, I, and I'm totally open to doing it. And my my phone book is always open for that. But for some reason, life kind of sends me these things where in this case me and Andy Martin Jelly were considering writing you know kind of the Ellison solo record number two 
And that's where the idea came in, like, all right, well, who's going to sing on it? And, you know, Andy, Andy's got good instincts. I mean, he's the one who said, he goes, just fucking call Jeff. You love the guy. You love his voice. Like, just call him. And, you know, and, and I, I was kind of afraid. Well, what if he says no? What if he turns me down? What if he's too busy? You know, and again, it was just that moment. And so I sent Jeff writing on the wall. And, of course, that got this whole train out of the station. And, and Andy said the same thing with the label. He goes, um, it was a little over a year ago, he said, he goes, dude, call, call Joe at Rat Pack, man. I just played on something with him and man he's a great label and he'll totally know that and say so i sent it they called joe we'd known each other about 10 years and had been talking about doing stuff together and i said dude i, I think i got one for you that's cool and he i sent it to him literally he called me back like like within a day and i mean we worked the deal out within about two city blocks driving down shea boulevard by my house <laughs> and uh but um he uh you know, so Andy, you know, again, he's a guy I go to and I trust, Andy Martin Jelly, you know, and, and you know, really the album should probably say Ellison Soto Martin Jelly because, you know, he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's definitely the third Beatle on this one. But, you know, even when it came to the name, it's like, let's just state the obvious because we had some people go, well, you should come up with a band name. It'll be better for the merchandising. And I was like, I don't want to fucking like that. That's just now you're starting from zero. It's like, let's just state the obvious. It's Jeff Scott Soto and David Ellison, like just, just like, can we be any more obvious, you know? And you know, and Jeff's got the Soto band. I've got the Ellison band. It's like just fucking combine the two. There it is. Kind of let's, let's not make people think too hard about it. Let's just get them to get the freaking record on them and see if they like it, you know. No, we're crazy. musical whores. It's what we do. We're whores. <laughs> well, we you know, musicians our names out there. <laughs> you know, mu musicians, musicians play music. You know, whether you're a singer, a bass player, a guitar player, that's what we do. You know, and and I, I think at this point in our lives, you know, the fact that we still get to keep doing it is awesome. And you become better because you you know you become a bit more seasoned as a veteran in the business, and you you know what works. You kind of know we start to learn what doesn't work, and you know what's wrong with making music you know this 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 thing of like oh man you're in too many bands or doing too many things according to whose rule book i mean you know what i mean it's like and 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 like jeff said you know covid was a moment where everything was shut down and it was kind of like 9 11 none of us knew what it was how i think how serious is this is it going to last forever like what is this and i don't know i think for for a lot of us it's like hey we're home we got home studio capabilities it's like let's call our friends and just start freaking writing songs and making music. I mean, that's what we do. That's what kept us, that's what kept us from going down the rabbit hole and negativity. It connected our community because we got hammered first, the hardest in our industry, you know? And I think when you can keep, in 2021, when we recorded this Ellis and Soda record, I mean, we were still in the midst of a pandemic full on. I mean, we, we literally couldn't fly to each other to make the record. And I think um, as much as I hate making internet records, I'd always rather be in the room. I think we did a pretty good job on this one. I agree. I, I think it, it really has a unique feel to it to the point where it does feel like you guys are all in the same room recording. So, yeah. you know, everybody did. And Andy did a tremendous job playing guitar. He's got a lot of light and dark shades in there. That's tremendous. <clears throat> Great guitar playing. So, kudos you know, he's a pretty ferocious guy. He boxes. He's like, he's, he's in your face and he plays guitar like that. You know, he's, yeah, he's yeah, an yeah. educated guy. He's a very, you know, he's a very astute musician um he teaches so he knows he knows his instrument he knows the the language of music and he's able to communicate i mean it's funny with me and jeff because we're over there you know the gringos speaking english and you know and he's Andy's over there chatting italian to the band and uh you know like going over you know it's an f sharp not a g or whatever he's saying to them you know and me and jeff are like i guess he's doing you know i guess he's got <laughs> but but so andy's communicating in several languages italian over to us in english you know so it's uh so it, it, it's, it's, it's pretty cool working with, um, with people in other languages and in other countries, you know, I mean, essentially the band is Italian, me and me and Jeff are the, the American guys, but you know, the band is, is Italian essentially that played on the record. Um, it's, I like that. I love the multicultural, you know, uh, dynamic. Uh, I think, I think I, I've been finding that working with musicians out of the U S um really adds a different uh dynamic there's a lot of incredibly gifted players mm -hmm. um and quite honestly they may not be heard unless they were on a record like something with me and jeff's name on it to sort of lift them up and put them into the spotlight which i love doing you know it's uh you don't you don't have to be famous to play with us you know what i mean it just you just have to be great that's all it really is and then you know your talents will speak for themselves did you guys sit down, you know, having some, you know, two guys being international, two guys being in the U.S., working remotely, 
did you guys have a vision for this album? Did you sit down and say, I want to do a heavy album. I want to do an album that has different variations. Was there any game plan that you guys sat down and thought about before diving in? It wasn't really, no, we, we were just writing. We were just writing to write. Yeah. We, David would pull in things. I, oh, I wrote this, I co-wrote this with others. Maybe we should finish this one up. And Andy had some things that he just kind of whipped up and said, hey guys, what would you think of this? It, we were just writing. We, we, there was no real course for action here. And it was the result is what, it's when we finally kind of rallied and pulled it together, tallied the whole thing together in, ter in terms of, if this is going to be real, we got to make sure that it's within sequence and it, it sounds like a band. It's got to sound like a yeah. record. It's got to sound like an intent and purpose, as opposed to just a bunch of random songs that we decided to write and and record. And so, yeah, I think the the overall structure of it came later when we realized we're going to actually do this. We're we're going to follow through with this. We're going to try to get it released and and put something together. But before that was there was no real thought process. It was all let's just keep writing them. And it literally was like every other day I'd get a new song. Jeff, just do this when you can. And I was so excited. I'd do it in no time flat just wow. to keep the process going because it, it became a process. It became a kind of a, its own little machine. And it was it was mm -hmm. a lot of fun, really easy to, to do. Terrific. You know, you guys are so talented and you've worked with so many different people in your career and not to mention names. But have you been in situations where it you got great talented players, big name guys, and it just doesn't work. You just don't connect musically. You just don't connect, have that chemistry. And you don't, again, you don't have to mention names, but just from your right. experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the worst things to do is sort of, and I've had managers come to me and booking agents and various people because they see dollar signs. They're like, well, what if we get you and we get this guy and that guy? Da, da. And it's like, you know, that's a great idea. And, you know, um, if you know the person, you're like, that's cool. But, um, you know, how about we start with, you know, the horse in front of the cart, which is, can we actually make any good music together? Because, you know, you can't sell names if the music sucks, you know what I mean? So there's, and look, like we're, we're in the business of selling music. I mean, that's what the music business is, but, you know, I think just like what we accomplished on this record, it was just this organic, um, we're just creating music first. And then if we, if we have something that's worthy, and then you call the labels and you call the people in the business and you say, hey, you know, do you want to give this a listen? And, and then then you can talk dollars and cents and schedules and et cetera. So that's kind of that's been my experience with it. Yeah, it sounds like if you're yeah, putting, yeah. Money, putting money first, it never works. You have to put the right, right. chemistry together. And I've, I've had a lot. I mean, J Dave, again, I'm going to I'm going to keep patting David on the back because he's just that he's a pattable on the back kind of guy. Uh, <laughs> we kind of cut from the same cloth in terms of how we work and who we work with. Uh, we're pretty easy to get along with overall. And I, I, I see a lot of David in myself in terms of we're, we're, we're chameleons in terms of being able to fit in situations. Of course, you're, when you're thrown into a situation where you're forced to or you're collaborating with somebody that's not necessarily working, we still find a way to keep it professional, respectful, courteous, and all of that stuff and get the job done until or unless it, it explodes or implodes in itself. We don't have that between us. We 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 kind of, like I said, we're cut from the same cloth in terms of how we view people, how we view our peers, et cetera, et cetera. So there was no, there, there was no, we didn't have to find the chemistry. It was already there in terms of our friendship and the personalities. But then as David started his reply, it comes from, do we have something here? Is, do, can we actually make good music together? And yeah, so it's, it, we've had, we've been in situations where we've had to kind of fight and claw to get it done. This one, we didn't. Yeah. Jeff, I'm, I'm kind of blown away by your response to the other question where you were banging out a song every day, not only lyrically, but you're like a, a yeah. melody genius too. You have a real gift for that. I've heard you sing the heaviest <laughs> of songs and the craziest of progressive songs. <laughs> and it's, it's truly a gift. And there's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of diversity on this. How are you putting this together, a song, lyrics, and melody in one day? I can't take credit for all of it, especially like a band like Sons of Apollo and even a, a, a project like Ellis and Soto. I'm always open to someone else giving me melodies or something that they hear under a song that they, they'll give me a piece of music. Is a, it's an open slate, an open canvas to for me to create over. Mm -hmm. If they have something, I welcome it because I know I'm going to kind of carve it and make it my own anyway. But uh, I almost 
rather have a melodic idea or a melody idea as opposed to being the one that always comes up with it. So that kind of assists me in terms of how much I'm able to create in, within the course of a, you know, a month or even a week. If I have kind of a bitmap, I, I create a lot faster. I can write melodies. to I mean, I can write lyrics to somebody else's melodies that are already there and vice versa. Somebody gives me lyrics. I can kind of form a melody to, to make sure those things fit as well. And, and David and I, there was a lot of back and forth in terms of like he would send me like extra lyrics. It would be like extra context that I could have used. And he said, you can either go with this or go with that. And it was great that I could get any any input is always welcome. And of, of course, as a singer, I always get the <laughs> I get the credit for it. But it's not always the case in terms of especially in Elvis and Soto. Andy would send me melody ideas. David would send me melody ideas. And of course I would come up with my own and that makes the process a lot faster and a lot smoother, but it also makes it a lot more diverse because it's not just all coming from me. It's it's something I'm, a, I'm actually able to carve and create based on somebody else's idea. It's a real band at that point, you know? When yeah. You're doing that, it's all collaborative. David, did you write a lot of the lyrics on this? What I did, I actually, I wrote a lot of lyrics. There was, um... You know, it's funny, Vacation in the Underworld, for instance, is a, it was like a concept, because it's Steve Conley, who, he and I were in a group F5 together some years back, and then um, I helped him get the gig in Flotsam and Jetsam, and he's, and he's a great writer, and he, he actually sent me the track, he said, hey, it was like one of these COVID, you know, you want to play bass on this, and he sent it to me, and I played bass on it, and I went, listen, I'm starting to work with Jeff Scott Soto on some stuff. Do you mind if I have him throw a lyric on this? I think this is your throw a vocal on it. I, I think this is better than just a COVID YouTube track. And uh, Ken Mary's actually playing drums on it. Right. Um, and so that's one of the only ones that was sort of brought in uh, with that and the revolution. Actually, Steve brought the music in for that too. And I, I love both of them. I thought they were very cool. And so I, I asked his permission to, you know, it's for, to throw them in the, in the mixer with these. And so with vacation, I had kind of a rough lyric idea and I sent it to Jeff. I said, what do you think about this? And he said, dude, I got this. And he just took it from there and, and wrote and wrote the rest of it. Um, and, and including the melodies, you know, I kind of had a little bit of, so how about if we sort of like sing here and here and here and that kind of stuff. So sometimes I would do those suggestions, but then, you know, just let Jeff take it. Like a bullet is another one. Uh, it was kind of a rough idea. Um, and, and I'll never forget it. Cause I was actually in Nashville and I was on the life cycle at the hotel and had my phone with me. And all of a sudden he's Jeff sends it through. He goes, check this out. I'm listening to it. I'm going, Holy shit. This is amazing, man. I was, I, you know, and you know, from there I was like, I don't know, let's tweak a word or two here and there. No problem. And, you know, so, you know, some of these things, I think probably the one sharpen the sword is a song Andy wrote musically. And it was I a real like powerhouse <laughs> reference. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. I'm looking at it like here. Um, and it, and it's, it's, it's funny because, uh, it was a powerhouse song and, and I think that might've been maybe the kind of the, after Jeff sang on writing on the wall, uh, for me, which was kind of our introduction to this whole thing. I think that might've been, I talked to Andy go, I don't know, should we send him this one? What do you think? Again, you know, it's kind of this, let's see what, you know, see if he even likes it. And he sent it over and it came back. And I think that was the one that really turned up the gasoline as far as, okay, this is bringing Jeff back to, I think, as a fan of Jeff's and the old school kind of power metal thing. This one really put him back in that centerpiece of that. And, and um, I can't even remember, I, I guess, I guess there were some lyrics maybe, but you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's collaborative, you know, just the same way you'd be in the room, you know, um, throwing ideas back and forth, uh, having this musical conversation, you know, we were able to have that same conversation virtually um again by way of quarantine at this at this point but to just hey jeff what do you think of this one and then have it come back and go and with harmonies and everything going holy shit man it's like this thing is like completely fucking stacked up with like kick-ass harmonies and 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 you know i kind of forgot about some of the harmonies until we were learning the songs to go on tour <laughs> yeah. last month and then jeff's like hey by the way is anybody gonna sing these harmonies like oh shit that's right and it's it's my nature I always say I'm kind of the Michael Anthony guy. I sort of go for like sort of the, you know, the third or fifth kind of the higher. That's just been my nature growing up as a as a kid, as a bass player. I always kind of grab that that harmony. And and it was funny. We kind of found it through even just three shows and a couple of rehearsals kind of found these little, you know, little harmony things that I could join in and and kind of, you know, sing, sing, sing to Jeff, because obviously there's a ton of 
I mean, it's a very vocal heavy record. And, yes. and I think that probably comes from Jeff listening to a lot of Queen and, you know, just his influences that aren't metal. Um, it brought a, it, it brought that in. I mean, I, I, you know, would say that I think when, when we sent stuff over to Jeff, he would bring back a finished product. It wasn't just sort of, ah, well, I just sort of scattered a sketch of an idea. What do you think? It was none of that. It was like, fucking, it came back done. And, and that's why we were so <laughs> impressed by it. And it was kind of like, check. All right, next song, let's send him five and six <laughs> and seven. Let's see what he does with these, you know? And, and because at that point we were, we were really working like a band, you know, it was yeah. just really yeah. collaborating. And, and, um, you know, there's a couple like celebrity trash, uh, Jeff, you know, again, I, it was just kind of, I remember I wrote the lyric, I think flying into Luxembourg one day, I just sort of sketched out these ideas and I sent it to Jeff. He loved it. And then he took it and made it his own and, and, you know, you know, certainly co-wrote it and kind of skewed the ending of it to have a, a storyline and that one and, and the song Lone Star, which is one of the digital tracks, um, you know, it's so funny. I, I did an interview yesterday and the guy goes, dude, I love Lone Star. I said, that's so cool because that, I think that's Jeff's favorite song in the record. He always <laughs> talks about it and we yeah. never played it after we recorded it. And, but it's just kind of this, this sleazy, slinky, groovy kind of tune. And, you know, um, so it, it, it's funny which ones, you know, kind of become our own personal favorites yeah, either yeah. through, you know, how we created it or just the outcome of it. I think my personal favorite was Hercules leading into, um, what was it called? Rise. Rise to win. Yeah. Rise, Rise to win. win. Yeah. It was almost it struck me as almost like a Ides of March into Rat Child. Um, yeah. When you play that, are you going to play that back to back? Because I think it works from the bass intro, <sighs> you know, to the previous song. You know, it, it, it's it's funny. I was thinking about it, and it, it, it we we were talking about doing Hercules and then even extending it in the live show, and we didn't get to it on these three shows just because we wanted to really, you know compact and focus the you know the tunes together but you know it's funny that Hercules I was literally sitting in the studio cutting bass to another song and I just started playing that and I I said to John the engineer I said dude hit record right now just give me a click at this tempo hit record and he did and I just played that line I didn't remember what the hell it was I just laid it down and I sent it to Andy and then he you know came up with the rest of it and and I said let's just keep it as a little instrumental interlude and um, you know, we, we put it in front of rise to win and, you know, rise to win was my, you know, let me just break out every bass lick I know from Jocko to Billy Sheehan and double hand Stanley Jordan and do, 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 just every fretless fretted, whatever, just fucking rip a bunch of licks. And then, you know, we sort of built, you know, built the, the intro on it. And, you know, like Andy was encouraging me, he goes, dude, your name's on this record. You need to fucking kick ass and just melt faces with some bass licks. And, and I was like, okay, well, I'll get on it. <laughs> and uh, you know, so again, you know, you know, coming from the guitar player, it's like, dude, step up and really fucking play bass. Like I, as a fan of you, I want to hear that, you know? So I think we all got to have our, you know, shining moments, you know, as guitar, bass, vocals, and, and really fucking lay down the goods. Again, with me and Jeff's name on it, it kind of needed to be that way. Yeah. When you're writing lyrics, David, um, whose voice are you hearing in your head? And it, was there a point where maybe it switched? to Jeff that now I'm thinking about Jeff after I hear a couple of shows. Sure. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I think for me, I kind of write melody and lyric at the same time, right? Like if I'm hearing, uh, you know, kind of, you know, cause you're always, it's the vowels. You know, these, the vowels kind of, it's for me determine, you know, the, the melody. And then, um, you know, sometimes I would have a lyric sheet, like Jeff said, and at the bottom, I'd say additional words, because <laughs> you never know when any one of those lines, Jeff may go, you know what, I fucking love this line down here. It's not even in the song. That's a killer line. I'm going to run with that. And sometimes that would be, you know, an inspiration. And I would say that it's like, hey, this is all open, you know, open table here. Go for it. Um, so for me, you know, it, it is that. And then you know, then I, I guess because we were creating something new and it's I guess it's the beauty of creating a debut album is there is no history. Right. It's the old adage. You have your whole life to write your first album and about nine months to write the second one, yeah. <laughs> because once you put the first one out, now the die is cast. And, you know, sure. I think about, you know, the Boston album or, you know, other great albums that I grew up with. It's like once that first one comes out, that's that's the bar now, you know. Um, so certainly as we started working together um you know jeff's voice is pretty much impenetrable as far as as well we got to sing it in this range or you know he can't go too high or oh boy you know he's this really 
you know, cathartic or nasty creature that we have to fucking write shitty punk rock lyrics for because, you know, <laughs> you know, we could, you know what I mean? Because some people, you do have to write like that. It's like, okay, there's, this guy's a kind of a character and you got to write a lyric that he's going to sing believable, you know, because, and, and that's part of lyric writing. It just is yeah. what it is. You know, you, you, you write for the character uh, that's, that's singing it. And Jeff, you know, um, I'm talking about Jeff as if he's not even here, but <laughs> Jeff, for him, for him, I'm not. I, I nodded I, off ages ago. I, he's I, back I, in Rome. I, I, yeah, no, I I found that for for Jeff, he going into character because singing is kind of character acting in a way. Um, you know that to go into these different things, whether it's celebrity trash, the vacation, the internet world, whatever it was, you know that was the easy part for Jeff. You know, and vocal ability unlimited. So it was just kind of like. I could, I could kind of throw anything over to him and, and, and he would make it his own and bring it back. And, and, you know, having a voice that's very recognizable, you know, that when you, when you hear Jeff sing, you know, it's him, you know, that's, that, that was the easiest part of the whole thing, quite honestly, um, for me as, as on any lyrics that I wrote on this thing. That's cool. You know, you guys are two of the hardest working musicians I could think of. And um, there's a quote from when I was a kid, evil can evil used to say it. He goes, um, you never fail. You're never a failure until you fail to get back up. And you guys always are very resilient. You always get back up in your musical careers. Tell me individually about those pulling, pulling yourself back up and getting back up on the horse. I, for one, uh, I, I started in this business with the I'm never I'm never going to stop. I'm not, I'm never going to quit. Mm -hmm. The resilience factor was at a, such a high level when I started back when I was 18, I started professionally with Yngwie Malmsteen and I knew I had a mission. I had a mission to complete. I've not even come close to completing that mission. I'm going to be 57 next week. And for me to be able to still continue doing what I'm doing and loving what I'm doing. And, and st I still have that hunger and the desire to do what I'm doing. That was, that was a resilience that was, it was born before I even knew what was the word meant mm -hmm. and, and what it was going to entail. Um, I've hit way more downs and lows than I've had highs. I've had a, a, a few really, really good highs in my life and my career, but those are the moments that truly keep me going. Because if I got to that point, even if it was under somebody else's umbrella, like stating like, like journey or trans Siberian orchestra, I can't take credit for the creation of those things, but I got to enjoy the benefits of those things that's the bar that's the level that i'm aiming for with everything that i'm doing with elves and soda with my solo albums with everything i aim for that bar and i will not quit until i get there even if it kills me even i even if i never get there but for me i i love it it's the it's kind of the thrill of the chase so to speak i love that i'm always trying to reach for that brass ring even if i never get it even if i never achieve it on my own level the falling means nothing to me because I will always, for me, it's just like tripping on a step that I trip. Well, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going up those stairs. I'm going to keep running up that uh, like Rocky Balboa or running up to, to get to the top of that, uh, that those stairs. That for me was always the end game. And there was, ne there was never going to be a reason to step back from it. That's awesome. Great. Very insightful. How about you, David? I honestly can't think of anything else to do but this. So I have no idea what I'd do if I wasn't doing this. And, you know, it is, there's that Japanese saying, you know, fall down seven, get up eight. And, um, you know, it's, it, uh, you know, the, 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 the adage of, you know, tough times never last, tough people do, you know, and just, you know, get, getting through it. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's like, we're just all living in the human condition, you know, so, you know, the stuff that comes at us, um, you just kind of keep moving through it. I mean, you know, I think you try to control the things from within that you can control. And then there's things from without. I mean, um, career wise, you know, who saw Nirvana coming? <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I remember the 90s. That was, you know, for me, one of when my career, one of the big highlight, you know, seasons of my career, the early 90s. And all of a sudden Seattle came upon us like, you know, and pretty much destroyed thrash metal you know which was yeah. my genre at that time and you know and I, you know i just i love you know clint eastwood and heartbreak ridge you know it's like overcome adapt and improvise you know that that becomes the marching orders you know <laughs> if you can overcome adapt and improvise you know half the shit we're just making it up as we go i mean you know even even this record 
sitting around, I don't know, let's call Jeff, see what he's doing. You know what I mean? And bang, here we are a year and a half later talking about, you know, I think a pretty good record we made. And so, you know, following your instincts and following your gut and just saying yes, you know, because, uh, you know, you know, the, you know, the yes man movie with Jim Carrey, I always say, it's like, just, if you need to pick me up, watch that. It's funny, but it's true. You know, it's, it's like, when you say yes, just the opportunities keep coming and you, you, you know, that, that to me is kind of the deal um, is, is just always being in the room. Um, you know, because if you're not in the room, the opportunity can't happen. So just get in the room, man. Get in the room where the action's happening. And I've said enough yeses awesome. for a lifetime. I'm 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 learning to say no now now these days. <laughs> right. Well, and 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 there is and there is truth to that too. Is, is you know, after a while, you 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 find I, I say say yes because it it yeah, gets it just gets it in motion. But you're right, Jeff. There there comes a time where you go, okay, I've got a couple things. They really require full attention. And now I do have to start stripping. Well, I, I do the same thing. I mean, I yeah. say no to stuff all the time when people come along um, asking me for things. And it's like, yeah, that's that's just not in my wheelhouse. I can intuitively I feel that has no that is no lane on on my highway right now. You know what I mean? And and rather than say no, sometimes it's like, yeah, not now. You know, maybe we'll catch it again another time. You know what I mean? Then you're always leaving the door open to something. And because, you know, I, I've had things end and they come back around again. You're like, all right, I guess we're doing this again. And, and you know, just like saddle up and go, you know. So um, that's just kind of how life seems to work, I think. I'm very insightful. I want to um, ask two more questions. Do you have the time? I, I want to be respectful to sure. your time. Okay. Sure. Uh, will there be a tour <clears throat> in the U.S. to support this album? Well, I think for, you know, one of the reasons we did the little run over in Italy is, is you know, as we were joking in the beginning, you know, we're we're in the same time zone and me and Jeff never see each other, you know, well, except on TSO, which is once a year, you know, because Christmas is coming and I know Jeff will be singing some Christmas songs. So I go see him every year. Yeah. But I mean, short of that, you know, uh, schedules and everything. Jeff happened to be playing a gig in Armenia. Um, I had to get over to Europe for some other stuff anyway. So I said, let's just carve a week out so we can fire this thing off and, um it turned out it was actually i think three weeks ahead of the release of the record so we're up on stage playing songs people had never heard which i think was probably the ultimate acid test of whether people are going to like it yeah. i always joke when the kid in the lamb of god shirt was singing our praises like okay we want him over you know like <laughs> you know if you got a lamb of god shirt on you're a dedicated hard metal head and he was hey, please do not let this be a project please make this be a band and, you know he's like <laughs> crying at the end of the night hugging us you know so I very, love when David does his accents. He's great. He's great with the accents. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like the same guy every time. <laughs> Rock and roll accents. <laughs> so, so, um, so, you know, for now, I mean, look, we knew June coming home, Jeff had some stuff with Jason Beeler. He was obviously heading into TSO World, which is kind of the fourth quarter of the year. And, you know, look, now now that it's out, it's up. And obviously we're here talking about it. You know, now the, the, the door is open for us to go do other stuff. You know, should it should it be the will of the universe for that to happen moving forward and cruises or whatever stuff that 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 may pan out for us? I'd love to see it. I'd love to see you guys do the whole album straight. So yeah, it's, it's pretty good, man. I gotta say, it's yeah. pretty good. So and would we, David? My last question. <laughs> so would we? Yeah. <laughs> David, my last question is: uh, How did things go with recording Kings of Thrash? Um, I heard that you were going into the studio last week. Did it happen? You were working on well. The you know, that's one of those things where you know, again, just through a doing the Nick Menza documentary, I uh, got reconnected with Jeff Young and we we're at the rainbow well, right after that. And he was singing me a riff that he wrote on the So Far So Good So What tour in 1988. I went, dude, I remember that riff. And so that led to us, we, we, we wrote some songs, we you know got them demoed up. And uh, when we did the tour last week, we, we filmed it at the Whiskey. So we've got all that. So we're just, you know, working on some live stuff, and studio stuff. So, um, you know, like everything, it, kind of finds its lane and, and uh you know moves on from there so it went well you recorded yeah 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 we've got tunes recorded and then the live stuff we captured as well Perfect. that's awesome how about you jeff what's uh what's the status of sons of apollo their their third album well at the moment we we're laying dormant because uh as the rest of the world is is waking up and we were all on, on a kind of holding pattern it uh everybody's diving back into their other day jobs. You know, Mike and Billy have winery dogs, Black Country Communion, all these bands were basically waiting 
we we always base our our opportunity our windows of opportunity to when we have time to tour and, and create and make new albums etc cetera, etc cetera. uh 2020 was supposed to be sons of apollo's run out and then 21 was going to be you know the next stages for where everybody else already exists but obviously we were able to kind of complete some things for sons of apollo this year but next year is a wash because we got winery dogs black country communion i'm doing i'm doing some other things i'm, I'm pretty sure it's gonna be another wet album I, and david and i've already discussed they, i think they've even written the whole next ellison soda wow. record so i think that's going to be more of a focus than the other things right now just because those guys have to play catch up as well as the rest of the world and so if there's anything with sons of apollo into the future i'm imagining it's not going to happen until 24. Okay, great. Well, I, I look forward to that. Guys, I want to thank you so much for your time. It was such an insightful interview, and I really love the album. I can't say enough great things. And hopefully you come to New York real soon, and I, I get to see you, you guys play. It's supply and demand, cool. you know. If we're looking forward to, we want world domination on this record and <laughs> this band. You know, we, we want the world yeah. to love it. But obviously, we are not. We can't force a tour. You when you, at the age where... You don't want to be uh, sleeping in a van and, and 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 or doubling up in a, in a crappy hotel room. We've we've lived those days. We were beyond those days. We want to make it so we know there's a demand, and we would absolutely go out and meet it. Great, great. Well, thank you so much, David. Thank you so much. Jeff. Cool. You're welcome, Robert. Yep. Awesome. Good to see you again, Jeff. <laughs> you too, David. <laughs> a stranger. <laughs> okay. Bye, bye, guys. See ya. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.